Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Isn't it wonderful that Christmas is on a Sunday this year? I, I like it a lot because it's a prelude to what Christmas in heaven will be like. We're going to be worshiping and praising the birth of our Savior every day. You know, I can't wait to celebrate Christmas in heaven. You know, unlike walking around looking at all the lights here on earth, all of heaven is going to be lit up by the radiance of his glory. Instead of placing Christmas presents under the Christmas tree, we're going to be casting our crowns down at his feet. Amen. Amen. And unlike Christmas here on earth, Christmas will never end. Every day we'll celebrate the one who loved us and gave himself for us for all of eternity. Would you please follow me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we love you so very much. It's all about you, Lord. Not only today, but every day. Because our hope lies in you alone. You are our only hope. There is no other. There is no other Savior. There is no other, oh, no other worthy of our praise and our worship. So, Lord Jesus, we give ourselves completely to you. We celebrate you alone because you loved us and you gave yourself for us. You provided a way for us to have eternal life. So we say thank you with all our heart. We love you. Would your spirit please guide us in our worship to you that we would be pleasing in your sight. Happy birthday. Merry Christmas, Lord Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
happy birthday. We are here to celebrate you, to make much of you. So Lord, as we continue to worship, I pray that our sacrifice should be a fragrant offering unto you. Because this is your day. Every Sunday is yours. But this one, we set aside to recognize that you came in human form for us. And it was out of love. When you looked at your creation and all its brokenness, and all its disharmony, and you took it upon yourself to fix it, we thank you for the gifts you give us, God. Speak to us. Encourage our spirits on this Christmas day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You all may be seated. May be seated. Thank you all again for joining us on this wonderful Christmas day. And we can celebrate the birth of our Savior together. Amen. 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 I know you can be in a very much, much warmer place, maybe a more comfortable place, but I'm thankful you that you're here with God's people. So we're going we're gonna to keep moving on. If you'll open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. We talked about how God gives gifts when we looked at the life of John the Baptist last week. And our, our point was when we looked at, at what God did, he did something miraculous and he answered prayer. And yeah, Zechariah missed it. He struggled with the idea that God would give him such a big gift. And they gave him this son's name like Yohanan in Hebrew, which means God has been gracious to us. God has been gracious to us. And as we come into today, that's what we need to remember. Right? God didn't just give us the gift of Jesus on the day we recognize December 25th. Now, yes, uh, for those of you who've been around the church for any great length of time, was Jesus born on December 25th? We don't know. Okay? Everyone should have said that. We don't know. He could have been born any other day. Um, they didn't keep our normal calendars, so it definitely wasn't December. Right? He would have been born somewhere in the Hebrew calendar, which is right different than ours. But how we got this date was the early church fathers said, hey, the, the prophet, any man of importance died nine months, or they were born, no, they died nine months after their birth. How they came to that conclusion, I have no idea. So they said, okay, we know when Jesus died, so let's count nine months, and that's Jesus' birth. It has nothing to do with paganism. You're going to hear that a lot during this time of year. The selection of December 25th had to do with his death more than anything else. Why? Because Saturnalia, which the other festival celebrated about that time, was done on the 21st of December, not the 25th. It was a two-week thing that ended then. So this wasn't something that the Christians made up as an alternative. This was something that they said, we have a Savior. We want to celebrate the incarnation that God sent we got his, his only begotten son for us. So let's pick a day to remember, to commemorate that God would do this for us. And so yes, this is not Jesus' birthday as far as we know. But we as Christians have chosen this day to celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. And so there's nothing wrong with celebrating that day. We could have done it any other time, but we chose this one. So let's look at what the incarnation is. So if you'll open up your Bibles, tablets, phones, whatever you're comfortable using, to Luke chapter 2. We're going to start there in verse 1. It says, In those days the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And they all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped in his swaddling clothes and laying him in a manger. Because there was no place for them to be in. So if you look at this, it gives us our place in time. Where Caesar Augustus said, we're going to do a census. Now we see a census somewhere done earlier in the Bible, and it did not make God happy. David did this. Why was this something that would dishonor God? It was the ultimate flex of an emperor to do a census. It showed, look how powerful I am. Look how many people I've conquered. And look at how great of an emperor. That right? This was all about is how great Caesar would be. And little did he know that the 
king of kings would be born during the census. That his reign would never come to an end, unlike Caesar Augustus. So again, this is the place in time. It's during Quirinius. So it's saying, look, we're not making this up. Right? Luke is, this whole reason Luke wrote this book in the book of Acts, they're apologetic books. He says, dear Theophilus, dear friend of mine, I am writing these things so that you may know of the Savior. So Luke wanted to make sure that this, this didn't feel made up, this didn't look made up. He said, you can go look it up yourself. And historians can. And so here you have Mary and Joseph. Right? She's pregnant. And we, we spent other Christmases talking about the event of how Joseph and Mary had to deal with a divine conception. But I want us to take a more earthly look to it for just a moment. They're being told by one of the greatest emperors. But yet, they're slave masters to go back home. Now, if you notice, he didn't stay in Nazareth. That's not where he was from. He was in the line of David, Israel's greatest king. He got to go back to Bethlehem, the house of bread, the house that God would raise up and one day bring a Messiah through. And so he would have all this history. There would have been citadels and temples. There would have been, this would have been a place of, of high reverence. But since the Romans, since the Babylonians, since the Assyrians, since all the people that have come in, this was now just a poor farm town once again. All the history, all the greatness of David, shadowed by tyranny. I don't know if that hits you like it hit me when I go through this story. But it's really easy to look at the world around us and see the great darkness that's in it. See its depravity. See, it's just going the opposite ways of God and think, man, how, how are we as the church ever going to make it? How are our kids going to make it? We're losing the culture wars. We're losing all of these things. But that's not the mindset we need to have. You see, in the midst of all the darkness and all the tyranny, the Savior came. Amen. What made that time possible for the Jews to move on was that a Messiah was coming. One who would take away the sins of God. The world. Amen. Now keep in mind, these, the Jewish people, they didn't want just somebody to take their sin away. They wanted somebody who would overthrow the government. And what we're going to talk about, about that as we close. But they wanted a savior who would set up a kingdom for the Jewish people. So they would never be conquered and reigned over again. And I think there's moments where we as modern day Christians, we lose the fact that Jesus did not come to set us up as a kingdom. He came to set us free from sin. Like, the gift of God is not a place where we are free from trouble. The gift of God is our free from the bondage of sin. That's what Christmas is about. It's the reminder that no how hopeless, how dark, the King has come. And we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait just for, for God to move. Eternity started for you and I the moment we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. The kingdom of God for you and I was at hand in that moment. So we don't lose the culture of war. We are not on the backside of history. We are not losing and failing because we are the church. We are victorious because we're God's people. So we can celebrate. We can get to these moments, to these days, to the holidays. In the midst of all of our brokenness and all this stuff. In the midst of pain of loss. In the midst of broken families and relationships. I understand how difficult the holidays can be. But God came so that we may have hope. So that our sin will be taken away. And if he can forgive the inexcusable in me, as C.S. Lewis says, I can forgive the inexcusable in others. Amen. I can forgive the inexcusable in others. Amen. And so when it was time... She gave birth. Now it says in the manger, and you've you probably seen different renditions of this, most likely they weren't going to some stranger's place. They were going to family's place, and they relaxed. So they said, hey, got to go to the outside, to the manger. Our Savior, the incarnation of God himself, that John calls him the Logos. That means when God spoke, it was Jesus who was the creative power that put all of our stuff together. Colossians says, all things are made through him, for him, and by him. And in him, all things hold together. And that person is Jesus. Amen. The fullness of God 
in the fullness of man. He didn't get born to a palace. He wasn't born to a king. He wasn't born in a synagogue or at the temple. Our king was born in the manger. Amen. To two teenagers from Nazareth. God came just like a normal person. And he came for normal people, just like you and me. He didn't say, oh, I'll, I'll save the special. No, I have something set apart for the rich and for those who get it all right to get it all together. I came so that all may have life. And let's see how he demonstrates that here, just this next part of the passage, if you read with me. This is verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch on their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you... Is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with this angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace amongst those with whom he is pleased. And when the angel went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord made known to us. Hallelujah. So they went with haste. They found Mary and Joseph laying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who had heard wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all we had heard and seen as had been told to them. So when we started this service, it was a little different. Usually we have our computers and projectors and our electric guitars and all of those things. But today we did something different. We did something different because we want to all sing and praise God together. We sang as a choir. I know we don't do that much. But that's what we did. And it wasn't just us up here, it was all. Amen. That's what happened the first Christmas day. Hallelujah. And it wasn't, again, in some lavish synagogue. It was in a field to the lowest of the low. An angel appears to shepherds. Now, if you're not familiar with where shepherds stood in the uh, social ranking order of the day. We talked about this last year, but I think it's really important to emphasize. These guys were not... Like, once I'm a low in the totem pole, they were not on the totem pole, okay? Like, they were way down there. As a matter of fact, a shepherd could not bear witness in court. And, and this is in a culture that was so misogynistic, women weren't allowed to give witness in court. They said, why? Because they weren't trustworthy. The slang word for shepherd was the same word for sinner. And they were viewed as dirty and outcast. Why? Because they kept the fields, they kept the sheep. And whose sheep were they? priest. And because they kept and they stayed out by these flocks by night, the priests were not allowed them into the temple because they were unclean. So these guys were out there. And I guarantee you this, right? We know this from other parts. There's a star and nobody saw it. Who saw it? Pagans from a whole other place looking for a Messiah to be born. They didn't say pay its flaw. And I guarantee you the, the shepherds would have had a great vantage point. Wow, look at that star. God must be doing something great in that city. But not for us. Not for me. Not good enough. I don't know enough. I'm a shepherd. Why would God want me? I mean, if there's many of you today have been there, gosh, I'm on it. I feel like I'm on the outside. I'm trying to walk with God, and I just, I can't even bring myself to church regularly. I can't bring myself to pray regularly. I can't bring myself to read. God doesn't want me. What happens in this story? God sends an angel to them. Hallelujah. 
He says, I see you. The first people that get heralded about the Savior are lowly shepherds who are nothing and nobody in the culture. Hallelujah. God comes for the underdog, for the nothing and the nobody. And a lot of us can identify with that, I think. I'm saying, like, man, I didn't come from, you know, quote, 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 great stock spiritually. I didn't come from a place like, I'm not a seminarian, I don't know. God said, I came so that you can see me. The lowest of those, the angel comes. And they were afraid because if God showed up to me, we must be in trouble. At a moment like that, just earlier this year, we had a, our, our, we were four of the church planting meetings. And the head of church planting came to mind. I said, oh, no. What did I do wrong? Right? This is the first time. I got from the principal's office, right? And I think there's moments where God shows up and I'm like, oh, no. What did I do wrong? Why is he here? What does he convict me of this time? And I'm sure that's what they thought. But they said, don't be afraid. I'm coming with good news. Hallelujah. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. That there is salvation for all. Thank you, Lord. And it is a gift given, not something earned, not something warranted. It's he saw you and I, and he said, I love you enough to give you the gift of the incarnation of my son. So that you won't have to be alone. So that you can identify with me. God knows how to identify with me. He's God. He's omnipotent. But now we know that he knows. Right? We know that he knows. The main reason I'm a Christian, quite frankly, is a Christmas story. It was the most compelling evidence to me. It was so unique, so different from any other God or belief system. That God would come out of eternity. The all-powerful God... And he would become a baby, vulnerable, having to have two, I'm sure, knuckle-headed parents raise him. They were humans. And he had to have siblings. Could you imagine hearing that in your life? Why can't you just be more like Jesus? <laughs> right? Like, that would be the worst thing ever. Shockingly, when he came out and said, I'm the Lord, his siblings said, <clears throat> right? They did not believe. They came later. They're like, whatever, dude. Like, you were good our whole childhood, but this is too far. Like, that was, he lived a normal life. Get hungry. Got yeah. thirsty. He was tempted. He felt every pain, every agony you and I would feel. Amen. One of the reasons I hold on to Christianity is there's no other belief system where the God himself experiences the pain of his people. God didn't sit on the throne and allow us to just suffer. He could have. He could have said, I don't want any part of that. I'm so holy, I can't touch sin. So I don't want any part of that. We put on his son. He became sin. Who knew no sin? Amen. For you and for me. That's what Christmas is about. Amen. The gift of salvation. Amen. That we be saved. Right? He is Yeshua. That's what I said. We talked about how Yohanan last week, God has been gracious to us. Yeshua is God will deliver us. Right? God has been gracious, but God will deliver me from my sin, from my brokenness, from my pain. No matter what's going on in my Christmas season, no matter what relationships are broken, whether I broke them or somebody else did, whether I have sickness or I'm healthy, whether I had a million presents or had no presents, whether I celebrate the holiday at all or don't, God gave the gift of salvation. We commemorated this day. Hallelujah. And it all started with lowly shepherds and then coming. Again, to humanize this. You get Mary and Joseph, they're, I'm sure, cold in a manger. And then a bunch of shepherds show up. Again, Jesus did not ask Mary and Joseph if the shepherds would come. There was no way there was asking permission. God said, go see the baby. Yeah. And I imagine Joseph was counting himself. I think I can take out at least five or six of these jokers. Right? Like he had to be counting. But then they said, no. Angels appeared. And they told us, can we worship him? Hallelujah. See, they had no gifts. Right. They weren't high enough for status. They probably didn't even have money to get a gift for the Savior of the world. They weren't worthy enough to have even a gift for Him. So it is with you and I. The 
There's no gift I could give God to earn my salvation. Amen. There's nothing I could walk up and say, see, I serve this. It would all fall short. Amen. So I just have to accept that it is grace. And it is grace alone. The free gift of God. Woo, hallelujah. That is Christmas. Amen. The free gift of God for you and I and all of mankind. And he is coming again. But he came so we may experience eternity now. Not something that's just far from the future, but so that you and I can have something now. So uh, if, you, if you want you to turn in your Bibles real quick to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. This is one of the prophecies that's given about Jesus' coming. This is what the Jewish people would have read and would have waited for, for the Messiah to come. And this is this is still a promise that holds true for you and I today that Messiah did come. He doesn't come like we think. My prayer for all of us is that you don't miss what God is doing. That God can do the miraculous. That God can still save the world. Our country is not too far gone. Why? Because Jesus is on the throne. Your family is not too far gone. Why? Because Jesus is on the throne. Amen. Your finances, your marriage, your mental health, your physical is not too far gone because Jesus is on the throne. We have victory in Christ. We just have to live like it. And I'm not talking about us trying to be the whole, you know, I'm going to claim this and make that. No, this is about Jesus. Do I trust him? That what he does in my life is for my good, for his glory. So let's read this. We'll start here. In verse 2. Actually, we're in the beginning of, of chapter 9 of Isaiah. It says, There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he made glorious the way of the sea, so that the land beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the nations. And the people who walked in darkness, they've seen a great light. And those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. So they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. As they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of this burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of the oppressor you have broken as in the days of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior and bad they every garment rolled in blood will be burned as a fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Now the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, he will establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. And from this time forth, forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Christmas is recognition that God gave His Son for us all. The best way you can honor God, the best gift, again, not about salvation, but how do I honor what He's done for me? Is to walk in the confidence that I walk in His government, His kingdom, His righteousness, yeah. not this world's. Hallelujah. We don't belong here. And then for many of us, we look at the world and go, man, it's falling apart, it's this and it's that. That's the longing pains inside of all of us believers that you weren't made here. The reason we're so uncomfortable in the world, we weren't made for it. And this is a wonderful reminder. What were we made for? We were made to bring glory to God through loving Him and loving others. And in that reality, we find we find hope. We are not defeated people. You are not crushed down. You are not destroyed. Hallelujah. His grace is in you every morning. Yes. And yes, we may fall, but the question is, will I get back up? Amen. Yes, we have an enemy, and we're going to talk about that in the new year. It's all spiritual warfare and the armor of God. That's going to be our focus in the first part of January. This is really important. But it all starts with, do I believe? In the Christmas story, in the gospel, that 
we can make it. And be victorious. Not just, not just surviving, but thriving. Living the life abundantly. Jesus promised each one of us. It has nothing to do with our stuff or our finances. It has to do with my relationship to Him and my relationship to others. I could be poor monetarily, but be very, very rich in eternal matters. When our eyes can be fixed on eternity or temporality, then we have hope. Amen. Then we have joy. Amen. Because everything is a gift from God at that point. Yes. Whether I have much or I have little. Whether our tree was full or whether we can afford to have one, Christmas was no less meaningful to us all. And it says we will be in a government that is on his shoulders. And he's our wonderful counselor. That means I can go to God and he will give me wisdom and how to conduct my affairs with my family and the world around me. He's the mighty God. There is none who can for God. Well, God says this will happen. It is done. If you actually look at the creation story in Hebrew, it's a beautiful picture of this. See, if you look at, at the ancient world, this is how we're going to close. Because we always like to talk about how did, the, how did the ancient world and pagans and all that affect this time. I don't know if you realize how important Christianity was to even pagans. See, let's take the oldest religion that ever existed. Zoroastrianism. It's been practiced for over 6,000 years. Buddhism and Hinduism are offshoots, and those religions are thousands of years old. And there's two gods, Huramansa and Ariman. One is good, one is bad. And they believe in duality, right? The good god may not be able to conquer the bad god, right? And so there's this constant struggle and turmoil. And I think we get that view of that's how God and the devil are. No. The devil is not his equal opposite. The devil is defeated. So when you look at the creation story, it says there was darkness that divided the light. And the darkness could not contend. That means even if the devil wanted to mess up creation, God said, stop it. I am God. So when God moves in our life and he declares it happens, it is so, and nothing can thwart it. Will I walk in that newness? Will I walk with expectation to 2023 that God is real and that God is moving? That he's never stopped working in the Garden of Eden until now. And we can reflect on the story of Christmas for that hope and for that strength. So when I say everybody, just bow your heads and close your eyes as we close today. And we can pray, come before our Father. Just say thank you. We we'll also have a time for us to respond. Lord, I thank you for each and every person that's here. I know there's, there's many other places that you've chosen to be. But I thank you that you've chosen to be here. That we can worship together. It is not lost on me the sacrifice so many people make to make this church continue. For the church is its people. But ultimately the church is yours. So first, Lord, I pray for anybody whose heart is broken this morning. Through restraining relationships or, or loss of loved ones or their health. God, I believe every word I said, you can bring comfort and beauty into these broken spaces. And if somebody is struggling this morning, I pray that they would go and get prayer with somebody who's in the back of the room. That way they're not going through this alone. Maybe today you're saying, I, I know Christmas story and I, I know a lot of this stuff. But I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if I die today, if I go to heaven. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So the question I have is, do you believe Jesus? And that's the confession I want to make today. Please go pray with somebody so that you may know. You may live in all the truth that we talked about today. Otherwise, that's for someone else. And I have my last thing is that we pray for one another. No matter what. That we remember why we celebrate Christmas. That we cut out some of that culture. Those are fun and those are fun. But let us not be distracted. Let's not miss what you are doing in our lives, in our world. For you are our king. You are the head of the church. And we serve you.
pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we just have a couple announcements and we'll bless everybody when we'll be out. All right, so we're still not back in national communities. We're going to wait until after the new year. We will have church New Year's Day, so we will still be here. We'll see everybody back. Um, other than that, have a blessed and wonderful, and as my son says, have a happy Merry Christmas. <laughs> um, uh, and Pastor, we stand for just a moment. As I bless, one last thing, we have a missionary here from Ghana. She has three dresses that, that she's selling. So, British people, if you feel led to give, she's going to be out out, of, uh, out in our foyer area here. If you'd like to talk about her, see what her ministry is doing, um, and support that, uh, you can give a love offering to her right there. Let's bless her and let's go celebrate with our families. So, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, give you peace. May his countenance rest upon you. May you remember that Jesus came for you, for your families, that you may be restored. Don't let the enemy take or break, for he does not have that power nor authority if you are his child. Walk in the newness and power of the Christmas story. Bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless.